So does Ozempic or Wegovy prevent heart disease? So back in November 2023, a study was published showing that Ozempic can actually reduce event rates, fatal and non-fatal MI, stroke rates, you know, cardiovascular death in people with already established heart disease. If you don't know me, I'm Dr. Allo. I'm a board certified cardiologist. I'm going to put all the graphics from the study up here. They're beautiful, amazing graphics. So if you're listening to this on the podcast, maybe you want to watch it on YouTube to see the really, really super cool uh, graphics. So if some of you don't know me, I practice obesity medicine as well. I've been helping people lose weight for a very long time. And when these medications came out, they were kind of revolutionary and pretty uh, groundbreaking. So we're super excited about this now. We've always known that weight loss in and of itself can help reduce MACE events. Well, MACE in cardiology is Major Adverse Cardiovascular Events, M-A-C-E. And the question has become, do these medications reduce MACE events or MACE endpoints or cardiovascular endpoints because they're causing weight loss? And we had a reanalysis of the study that showed that it may not be fully related to the weight loss. So let's go over the study real quick, kind of in detail, you know, the short version without going into excess detail, but we'll go into some of the results so that you guys can see them. Um, and it's pretty fascinating what these medications do. Now, I've been saying for a very long time that this, these medications, these GLP-1 inhibitors, are going to be approved for a lot of things. We know they were approved originally for diabetes back when Bieta came out in 2005. And over time, they got approved for weight loss because they inhibit your appetite. They do all kinds of things. They make you not eat as much. Now, we know that if you lose weight, a lot of conditions get better. Diabetes, hypertension, sleep apnea, kidney disease, which a new study actually showed that they improve kidney disease. All of these things. But the question is that this study tried to answer is, can they reduce cardiovascular endpoints? And the cardiovascular endpoints that they looked at in this study was death from any cause, cardiovascular death, fatal or non-fatal MI, myocardial infarction, which is a fancy word for heart attack, fatal or non-fatal stroke. And that's what they looked at. It ran for about 54 months. So 54 months is quite a long time. It had 17,000 patients. Now, 17,000 patients is also a long time. They had about 8,000 in each arm. They were very, very carefully matched. The average heart rates were the same. The A1Cs were the same. The systolic blood pressures were the same. Diastolic blood pressures were the same. The LDL cholesterol was 78. So they looked at people who had an average cholesterol that was already being treated down below 100. Um, they were already on lipid lowering therapy. 90% of them were already on lipid lowering therapy. Most of them were on antiplatelets or anticoagulation because they already had a heart attack or stroke. They have to be on aspirin, Plavix, Berlinta, whatever. Most of them were already on pretty good guideline directed therapy, meaning they're already on the best medications for the conditions that they have. The question that we're trying to answer is does Ozempic or these GLP 1 medications add additional benefit? to already being on the maximum, you know, medical therapy or medical treatment. And then did it have to do with the weight loss or not? So let's take a look at the study. It was 17,604 patients. They were randomized one to one. And I'm looking down because I don't want to mess up the exact numbers. It was a three part mace. They looked at CV death, myocardial infarction, whether it was fatal or non-fatal and strokes, whether they were fatal or non-fatal. And I'll put, like I said, the graphics up here so that you can kind of follow along. Um, they're beautiful graphics. And a lot of times when you see it visually, uh, it makes a lot more sense. So the first thing they looked at after 54 months of follow-up, and 54 months is a lot. I mean, 48 months is four years. You're looking at you know an additional six months, so four and a half years of follow-up. They had a 1.5% reduction in absolute risk. So people that were not on the medications had an 8% overall event rate. People on the medications had a 6.5%. This was a 20% relative risk reduction or a 1.5% absolute risk reduction. Now, if you've watched any of my videos or materials before, we know that as time goes on and the area under the curve continues to increase, the absolute risk reduction will eventually dwarf the relative risk reduction. You can go watch some of my videos on that. I have my cholesterol book coming out soon. If you go to dralonet slash cholesterol, that's dralonet slash cholesterol, you fill out the top form and you'll be notified right away when that book comes out, which is super, super soon. 
There is an entire chapter on absolute risk reduction versus relative risk reduction with beautiful charts and graphics explaining how this all makes sense and why it makes sense and why we should look at both and why both are definitely important. So they looked at both. The relative risk reduction was a 20% reduction overall. But if you look at some of these things, some of them were like 33%, but we'll get into it. So let's go on. Relative risk reduction. Oh, like I said, most of these patients, 90% were already on lipid lowering therapy. Most of them were already on antiplatelets. That's about an 86%. 74% were already on ACE inhibitors, which is another class of medications that after a heart attack or stroke, you probably should be on. Um, and most of them were also, 70% were also on beta blockers. And like I said, they were all pretty well matched. The one thing I did notice that was interesting was that the, the average A1C or glycosylated hemoglobin was 5.8%. Normal is under 5.7%. So if you're quote unquote not pre-diabetic, you're generally under 5.7%. In this study, the average was 5.8. So although they're not diabetic, because they're promoting the study or you know saying that the study was in non-diabetics on GLP-1s. However, in my definition, me personally as a physician, if your A1C is above 5, you have some element of insulin resistance. The closer and closer it is to 6.5, the more diabetic you are. 6.5% and higher, you're absolutely diabetic. 5.7 to 6.4, you are pre-diabetic. And anything below that, you're quote unquote not diabetic. But we know that most non diabetics, their A1Cs are in the 4 to 4.8, 4.9 range, maybe up to 5.1 or 5.2. I'll give you that. But generally speaking, above 5%, you have some element of insulin resistance. And this is not a lecture on insulin resistance. You can go watch my diabetes lectures for that. So I will note that although they were not diabetic, most of the patients in this trial did have at least some element of insulin resistance. Let's look at the hazard ratios and reductions. When you look at composite MACE, if you look at all MACE, all major adverse cardiovascular events, there was a 20% reduction, which is what we talked about earlier. If you look at CV death, cardiovascular death, you had a 15% reduction in cardiovascular death over these 54 months. If you looked at all cause mortality or death from any cause, you had a 19% reduction in all-cause mortality, pretty substantial. If you looked at fatal or non-fatal MI, you had a 28% reduction, which is fantastic. And if you looked at fatal or non-fatal stroke, you had a 11% reduction. Now, this is obviously fantastic. You really can't uh, argue with these results. The results speak for themselves. You really don't need any explanation. Like I said, again, I'll put the graphics up here and you can kind of look at them. Um, the one thing that I will mention also is what about their lipid results? Now we know that really, if you've watched my videos, the only lipid result that really, really matters is LDL cholesterol. They do comment on HDL and triglycerides and some of these other things, but we'll go here. You had a 46% reduction in total cholesterol. You had a 5.3% reduction in LDL cholesterol. You had a 4.9% increase in HDL cholesterol. And you had an 18.3% reduction uh, in uh, triglycerides. Now, the one thing I will note is because these are GLP-1 medications and help with quote-unquote insulin resistance, diabetes, prediabetes, although they're not indicated for prediabetes, you would suspect and expect you would expect a huge reduction in triglycerides, which is where you got the biggest reduction in 18%, 18.3%. LDL, though, was rather um, interesting. You got a 5.3% uh, reduction in LDL cholesterol, which is obviously fantastic. Every little bit counts. We, If you have medications that lower a little bit of this and a little bit of that, this medicine lowers LDL by this much. Eating more fruit, fiber, exercise, stopping smoking, et cetera, can lower it a little bit. Adding a GLP-1 apparently appears to lower LDL cholesterol 5.3% in people who are at least pre-diabetic or not diabetic in this study. When it comes to systolic blood pressure, you had a 3.8% reduction there, a one, I'm sorry, millimeter per millimeter mercury reduction. So like your, let's say your blood pressure, the top number was 133.8 or let's say 134, it dropped to 130. You had a one millimeter reduction in diastolic. So if you're 81, now you're averaging about 80. Your body weight decreased 9.4%, which is what we, which is a lot lower than the original select trial. This was, I think, the fourth phase. But the original select trial 
a lot of these people, because they were counseled on diet and exercise as well, they lost 16-ish percent of their body weight. This one was only 9.4%. So it's about half, maybe, maybe a little more than half of the body weight. So some of the results could be attributed to body weight, but we'll get into that. The heart rate dropped by 3.8 beats per minute, which lower body weight, lower insulin resistance, you know, more endurance, you're able to do more. Your, your heart rate will generally decrease now is three beats per minute a lot. Probably not. Um, the waist circumference decreased by three inches and the A1C decreased in most people by 0.3. So let's say they were 5.8 to begin with. They got down to 5.5. Not huge, but definitely significant took you out of diabetes range, or let's say pre-diabetes range, 5.8 is pre-diabetes, you drop down to 5.5%, you're out of pre-diabetes range. So those are all fantastic results. Obviously, nobody's arguing with that. We know that these medications do all kinds of things, and this is just happens to be one of them. Now, the question is, were all of these benefits seen due to the weight loss? You lose 9.4% of total body weight, you probably are going to have reduced waist circumference, reduced triglycerides, reduced LDL, reduced A1C. All of these things will improve, obviously, with body weight decrease. Now, the question is, what about the people who did not lose any weight or had a less than 5% change in body weight versus those who had a greater than 5% change in body weight? Another study or reanalysis of this 17,000 people was done, and they looked at that exact thing, people who lost 5% or more less than 5% change in body weight versus those who had a more than 5% change in body weight. And here's what they found. So this was um, analyzed by Dean Field. Um, I forget his first name. I think it was like Jacqueline maybe or Geraldine or something like that. Um, he wanted to analyze what if you didn't really lose weight. So he says that all of the groups benefited regardless of starting BMI. So whether you had a low BMI or a high BMI, all of the groups found, had the same or very similar MACE re endpoint reductions, whether it was like fatal amine, non-fatal amine, strokes, death from all cause, you know, cardiac deaths, what, deaths, whatever. All of them improved regardless of starting baseline BMI, starting baseline body weight, circum circumference, you know, waist circumference. Um, there was no relationship between the baseline anthropometric measurements like body weight, body fat, BMI, etc versus the actual results or benefits from these medications. They said that the benefit was additive and similar across, across lower BMIs as well as the higher ones. So that's good to know. Um, they said looking specifically at the weight change after 20 weeks when the full dose was finally reached, when they looked at the 20 weeks after you titrate the dose up to the full dose, and time to first MACE event, time to first cardiovascular event, Dean Field found that in the semaglutide patients, there was no difference according to whether patients lost 5% or more body weight or under 5% body weight, you know, gained uh, weight. The hazard ratios were 0.67 for those who body weight change was over 5%, and it was uh, 0.87 or 0.85, I'm sorry, for those whose body weight uh, did not change. Now, to me, that seems like a little bit of a difference when you go from a hazard ratio of basically 33% reduction versus 15%. So although both are good and excellent, and both of them are statistically significant, you know, within the 95 percentile confidence interval, to me, it seems like the group that had the bigger change in body weight, obviously in a downward way, they benefited the most, whereas the groups that uh, lost less or had less of a change in body weight in either direction had a slightly less uh, overall MACE endpoint change. You're comparing like a 33% reduction to a 15% reduction. It's almost double or like half if you look at it the other way. So he goes on to conclude that there may be alternative mechanisms that explain the benefits in these medications. And I agree with that. I definitely think that these medications affect a lot of things that we don't really know about fully just yet. But as time goes on and we have more experience with these medications, we will eventually know these things. We just don't have an exact answer now. We know they reduce your appetite. They make you feel fuller. They slow gastric emptying. They signal you to release more insulin, actually. So a lot of people are like, well, you know, insulin is the bad guy. The more insulin you you produce the more fat you store well not in this case so clearly that's not true 
Um, but generally speaking, I think these medications are fantastic. We go over a lot of this kind of stuff in my community. We meet every Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern time. If you want to join my community, go to drallo.net slash community, and you are welcome to join. Type the code one month and you can get in for free. One month is get you in for free for a month. If you don't like it, just cancel. No one will ever know. No one will ever care. If you like the community, you like talking to me every day, you get an app. You get to talk to me and text me all day, all night. What other cardiologist, certified personal trainer, internal medicine physician gives you access to them 24 hours a day through an app, texting, posting videos, posting labs, posting pictures, just having fun with me and my friends. And we get to talk for at least an hour once a week on Zoom Live. You can ask any question that you want. If you like stuff like this, please send it to all of your friends and share it with everyone. We'll catch you in the next episode. Peace.